The computer. A computer operates like a tape holding ones and zeros, with a device capable of reading and writing to it. This concept, known as a Turing machine, theoretically can compute anything, from graphics in a video to algorithms suggesting the video itself. Central Processing Unit. The CPU is an essential component inside the PC, made up of a piece of silicon with billions of microscopic switches called transistors. These transistors can be turned on or off based on the flow of electricity, functioning like light bulbs and representing two states, one and zero. Modern CPUs can perform billions of cycles every second, coordinated and synchronized by a clock generator. The speed of this clock is measured in GHz. People often overclock their CPUs to improve performance, which is effective but can potentially cause overheating or damage to the PC. Bit. The value of one of these switches is called a bit. A single bit on its own doesn't do much, but combining them together gives you a group of 8 bits called a byte that can have 256 different combinations of zeros and ones. Binary system. Thanks to the combination of bits and bytes, it is possible to store information using a system called binary. Each bit represents a power of 2, with 1 indicating that the power is included and 0 indicating that it is not. For example, a binary number can represent the number 69 through the sum of the powers of 2. Hexadecimal system. The hexadecimal system, also known as base 16, is more easily readable for humans compared to binary. It is commonly indicated by the prefix 0x and represents groups of 4 bits, allowing values from 0 to 15. This system utilizes the digits 0 to 9 and the letters a to f to express hexadecimal numbers. Logic and logic gates. Using transistors, you can create logic gates, which are electronic circuits that represent logical statements. For example, an AND gate turns on only if both inputs are active. By intelligently combining these gates, you can build circuits that perform calculations according to Boolean algebra, formalizing mathematical operations in binary. Character encoding. Although computers understand binary numbers, they are not very useful to humans. Using a character encoding such as ASCII, a binary number can be assigned to each character. For example, when you type an A on the keyboard, it is translated into binary code that the computer recognizes as the letter A and displays it on the screen. Kernel Operating System how these devices work together is managed by an operating system kernel, such as Windows, Linux, or Mac. The kernel acts as an intermediary between the computer hardware and applications, managing their operation and coordinating the use of device drivers. Machine code. Input devices allow you to give the computer instructions with the press of a button, but at the lowest level, computers only understand instructions in machine code, which is binary code telling the CPU what to do and which data to use. When it comes to following these instructions, the CPU is like a genius with the memory of a demented goldfish. It can handle any instructions, but it cannot store any data, so it's only really useful with random access memory or RAM. RAM. You can imagine RAM like a grid where every box can hold one byte of information, which can be data or instructions, and has an address. So the CPU can access it in four steps. Fetch from memory, decode instructions and data, execute, store the result. This sequence of steps is called a machine cycle. Since a program is essentially a list of instructions in memory, to run it, the CPU executes these instructions one by one in machine cycles until the program is complete. This process happens incredibly fast. CPU cores and threads. A CPU typically has multiple cores, each capable of executing different instructions in parallel. This parallelism allows for significantly improved performance. Each core can be further divided into multiple threads, enabling it to handle multiple instructions concurrently by rapidly switching between them. Machine code and instruction input. Despite the powerful capabilities of a CPU, it requires a method to receive instructions. Manually typing machine code would be impractical and extremely difficult. Instead, higher-level programming languages and various input devices allow users to interact with the computer without needing to write machine code directly. Shell. The kernel is wrapped in a shell, which is a program that exposes the kernel to the user, allowing for simple instructions in a command line interface, CLI, with text inputs. This provides a way to interact directly with the operating system's core functionalities. Programming languages. The most effective way to make a computer perform useful tasks is through programming languages. These languages use abstraction, allowing you to write code that is more understandable and manageable, which is then converted into machine code. There are two main types of programming languages based on how they handle this conversion, interpreted languages and compiled languages. Languages like Python use an interpreter, which executes the source code directly, line by line. Languages like C or Go use a compiler, which converts the entire program into machine code before putting it in a file that the CPU can execute. Every programming language has different syntax, but they all share some basic tools and concepts, such as variables, control structures like loops and conditionals, functions, and data structures. These tools help in writing clear, efficient, and organized code. Variables and data types. 
In programming, data is manipulated through variables, which essentially serve as placeholders for values. These values can be modified and reused throughout the program. The type of data a variable can hold depends on its assigned value. Text data types encompass individual characters such as A, B, or 1, and strings, which are sequences of characters like Hello World. Numerical data types include integers, representing whole numbers that can be either signed, negative or positive, or unsigned. Floating point numbers, on the other hand, include decimal points and are named as such because the decimal point can be positioned flexibly to balance precision and range, often utilizing scientific notation. Floating point numbers are represented using binary fractions, which may lead to approximation errors due to finite memory, especially when dealing with values like one-third. Extended precision types, such as long and double, utilize double the memory to enhance the range and precision of integers and floating point numbers. In terms of type declaration, there are two main approaches. Dynamic typing, languages like Python, determine the type of a variable automatically, without requiring explicit declaration. Static typing, languages like C mandate explicit declaration of variable types, such as int or float, before use. Pointers. The value of a variable is stored at a specific address in memory. Pointers are variables whose value is the memory address of another variable, denoted by an ampersand. Essentially, a pointer is a chunk of memory pointing to another chunk of memory. Pointer arithmetic. Pointer arithmetic involves manipulating memory addresses by adding or subtracting from them, allowing navigation through individual bytes of memory. In manual memory management, as seen in low-level languages like C, you're responsible for allocating and releasing memory. This occurs in the heap, a flexible memory area that adjusts as per the program's needs. However, this manual control increases the likelihood of errors, such as segmentation fault, so accessing or modifying memory beyond permissible boundaries, or memory leak, so failing to release unused memory, which can degrade program performance and eventually lead to a crash. Contrarily, automatic memory management, present in high-level languages like Python, involves built-in garbage collectors that handle memory allocation and deallocation automatically mitigating the risks associated with manual management. And regarding memory usage by data types, integers typically occupy four bytes of memory. Characters usually require one byte of memory. Strings are sequences of character bytes terminated by a null character, with memory usage varying based on string length. Arrays. Arrays are like boxes that hold many things in a line in the computer's memory. They are good at keeping things organized. Each thing in the box has a number, starting from zero. You can find things in the box quickly because they are all next to each other in the memory. Arrays are an important way to organize data in computer programs. They are good because you can find things in them fast. But there are some problems with arrays. They can only hold a certain number of things, and if you don't use all the space in the box, it's like wasting space. For more flexible storage, linked lists are a better choice. Unlike arrays, linked lists can change size easily. This makes them better for managing memory. Hash maps. Hash maps are like dictionaries where you have pairs of words and their meanings. They work by using a special function to find the place where each word is stored. Sometimes two words might go to the same place. When this happens, it's called a collision. One way to deal with collisions is to make a list at that place to store both words. Graphs. Graphs are like maps that help us understand the relationships between different data points. Imagine a graph as a road sign system. Each data point is like an intersection, and the connections between them are like the roads that link them. These connections can be directed, like one-way streets, undirected, like two-way streets, or have a weight, like longer or more expensive roads to travel. Graphs are very useful for finding the shortest paths between two points, like when you use Google Maps to find the fastest route from A to B. To find these paths, you can use techniques like breadth-first search or depth-first search. Trees. Trees are like family trees or organizational charts. They show how things are connected in a structured way. Every tree starts with a root and branches out into smaller parts, kind of like a tree's trunk and branches. Each branch leads to more branches until you reach the end, which is called a leaf. Binary trees are a special type where each part only has two branches. One useful kind of binary tree is a binary search tree. In this tree, the values are organized so that it's easy to find what you're looking for. For example, if you're searching for a number, you can quickly figure out which direction to go, left or right, based on whether it's smaller or bigger than the current value. This makes searching for specific values super fast and efficient. Functions. Functions are like recipes. They're a series of steps that solve a problem. You can think of them as mini programs that take in some ingredients, do something with them, and then give you a result. When you want to use a function, you just call it by name and give it whatever ingredients it needs. Every time you call a function, it gets added to the call stack, which is like a temporary memory system that keeps track of what's happening in your program. It's kind of like stacking plates in a cafeteria. Each time you call a function, it's like adding another plate to the stack. Booleans, conditionals, loops. Booleans, conditionals, and loops are like the building blocks of programming. They're what make algorithms work. Booleans are like light switches. They can be either on or off. We use them to make decisions in our code. Conditionals are like forks in the road. They let our program choose different paths based on certain conditions. 
So if something is true, we might do one thing, and if it's false, we might do something else. And loops are like repeat buttons, they let us do things over and over again. We have different types of loops, like while loops, which keep going as long as a condition is true, and for loops, which repeat a certain number of times. Recursion. Recursion is like a never-ending journey where you keep breaking a big problem into smaller pieces until it's easy to solve. It's like if you have a big puzzle, and you keep breaking it into smaller puzzles until each piece fits perfectly. But to avoid going on forever, you need a stopping point, like a base condition. It's like saying, stop when you get to this point. Without it, you could end up going around in circles forever, which is like when your computer runs out of memory and crashes. Memoization is like taking notes along the way, so that if you come across the same problem again, you already know the answer. It's like keeping track of what you've already figured out so you don't waste time solving it again. Time complexity and big O. Time and space complexity are like gauges that tell us how much work and memory an algorithm needs to do its job. It's like knowing how much time and space you'll need before starting a task. Big O notation is like a shorthand way of describing how fast an algorithm grows, as the size of the problem it solves gets bigger. It's like having a simple formula to predict how long it will take to finish a task as it gets bigger and bigger. So, by using big O notation, we can quickly compare different algorithms and see which one is the most efficient, especially when we're dealing with really big problems. Algorithms. Algorithms are like strategies or plans for solving problems. Just like how you might tackle a tough puzzle in different ways, algorithms offer different approaches to tackle computational problems. For example, you might try a brute force approach, where you just try every possible solution until you find the right one. Or you might use a divide and conquer strategy, where you break the problem into smaller parts and solve each part separately. Each approach has its pros and cons in terms of how fast it is and how complicated it gets. So, by understanding different algorithms, you can choose the best one for the job and solve problems more efficiently. Programming paradigms. Programming paradigms define different approaches to writing code, such as declarative and imperative programming. Declarative programming focuses on describing what the code does, while imperative programming provides explicit instructions on how to achieve a result. Object-oriented programming. Object-oriented programming is like building with Lego blocks. You start by creating blueprints called classes, which define the structure and behavior of objects. These objects are like individual Lego pieces. They contain both data, like color or size, and behaviors like how they connect to other pieces. Classes help keep your code organized and make it easier to reuse and modify. Plus, they support inheritance, so you can create new classes, called subclasses, that inherit characteristics from existing ones. It's like building on top of a base model to create variations with specialized features. So, OOP is a powerful way to structure your code and create flexible modular programs. Machine learning. Machine learning enables computers to perform tasks without explicit programming by learning from data. It involves training algorithms on large data sets to build models capable of making predictions or decisions. Machine learning finds applications in various fields, including image recognition and natural language processing. Internet. The internet is like a massive network of roads that connect computers all over the world. It enables communication and sharing of information between these computers. To make this happen, computers use special rules called protocols, such as TCP or IP, to send and receive data packets across these networks. Now the World Wide Web is like a giant library on the internet. It's where you can access websites and resources using web browsers. When you type in a web address, your browser sends a request using a protocol called HTTP, and then the server sends back the information you asked for. In a nutshell, the internet is the highway system, while the World Wide Web is the collection of destinations you can reach using it. Relational Databases Relational databases are like organized spreadsheets where data is stored in tables. Each table has columns and rows. To connect data between tables, we use special keys. A primary key uniquely identifies each row in a table, while a foreign key links rows between tables. Structured query language is like the language we use to talk to these databases. With SQL, we can ask questions to retrieve specific data, make changes, or manage the database structure. It's like having a conversation with the database to get the information we need. SQL injection attacks. SQL injection attacks are sneaky tricks used by hackers to break into databases through vulnerable websites. They do this by slipping malicious SQL code into places where users can input data, like login forms or search boxes. Once the code gets into the system, it can mess with database queries and extract all sorts of sensitive information, like usernames and passwords. To stop these attacks, developers need to tighten security measures, like checking and validating user input and using techniques like parameterized queries, which make it harder for attackers to pull off their tricks. If you like this format, check out this video. YouTube thinks that you'll like it.